What does the last week of Jesus mean? That's what we're going to talk about today. Jesus gave us a model for the work of the church at the Last Supper. While his disciples kept proposing more organization, hey, let's elect officers, establish hierarchy, set standards of professionalism. Jesus quietly picked up a towel and a basin of water and began to wash their feet. Philip Yancey. Today we're going to continue our conversation about the book, The Last Week, a day-to-day account of Jesus' final week in Jerusalem by Marcus Borg and John Crosan. I talked about this book in the last podcast talking about the Romans, and I want to reiterate that I think their research on the last week is very interesting, how they structured it. They're using the book of Mark as the template for their structure. But what they're really talking about is that Jesus was here to fight against this bad collaboration of the temple hierarchy and the Roman Empire and the what they call a domination system of social injustice against everyone. I don't agree with that. I think that Jesus came here so that we could live a better inner life, have better inner thoughts, and express love for our brothers and most importantly, express love towards God. He came here to save us from our sins. He did not come to save us from bad political systems. I'm just going to say that right now. I don't agree with that. But I believe that their individual points about individual stories are very interesting. And so we're going to take it on from there and talk a little bit about Jesus last week. And I think they're pulling a little bit out too much from Mark without looking at the complete Gospels. Mark says the message in a way they want to use as their theory. And I think if you looked at the full Gospels, you would see a different theory there too. But we'll talk about the book and a little bit about some of the lessons that are there. First, let's give the outline of the last week of Jesus. You probably know a lot of this. And if you've been listening to the Bible in small steps, we've talked about that because we just are ending Matthew and we are going through at this time of Easter. We are going through the last week of Jesus also. So let's just go over the outline of the week. So on March 29th, which would have been a Sunday, Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey, what we call Palm Sunday. People lay down cloaks and bows in honor of Jesus as a worship to their king and called out Hosanna, which means save us in a very desperate uh, way. (laughs) So they knew what Jesus was coming in. And this is a humble gate. This is riding on a humble animal. And so this is not the king you would expect coming in to the city of God. He loves to break that stereotype right there. He also later that day predicts his death. On Monday, March 30th, he curses a fig tree, and which is to talk about how Israel, the temple structure, not doing its purpose, not bearing its fruit. And then he also talks about the temple coming down and what will replace the temple after it is down. So I said, well, does Monday have a name? And my friend said that it's Mount of Olive Monday. Hmm, Okay, I'll take that. On Tuesday, then Jesus talks about the fig tree that he cursed the previous day, teaches him what it means. He also went to the temple ground and had various conflicts with the Jewish leaders. He also predicted his return. He challenged the practice of the temple selling things and turning it into a giant market, ripping people off. Then the religious leaders decided that they were just going to kill him. He left Jerusalem and then probably went back to Bethany to spend the night. I asked my friend too, I said, is there a name? And, And then I thought up Temple Tuesday. He was in the temple. Okay. On Wednesday, they mentioned that the plot was unfolding, that there were things going on. It was a storm was brewing, I guess, to say that it was about to come to a head. So on Tuesday, the disciples see the withered figs, and he told them about the importance of faith, about using their talents. And Jesus then was questioned by the religious authorities. He went up to the Mount of Olives and spoke about parables and the end of the age and talked about the destruction, the wars to come, and what was going to happen to not only them, but 
to everyone. And then also Jesus predicted that he would be handed over to the temple leadership and then crucified. At this point, Judas also planned to betray him, and Jesus knew what was going to happen. So someone said that this is called Spy Wednesday. You could also call it War Wednesday because a war is about to happen to him. And we also learn of the war to come. I'm just making days up now. I don't think anyone gave me the authority to make up days. Thursday, which we know is Maundy Thursday or Mandate Thursday, where Jesus gives his command. They are going to have their last supper, which is the Passover Seder. He is the sacrificial lamb. And he brings about his new covenant. He talks about his new community. He later goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. We began our times as humans in the garden, and Jesus is ending his time uh, for freedom in the garden as well. Jesus kept asking his disciples to stay awake while he prayed, and they kept falling asleep. He was in agony. He first asked for the cup to be removed from him, and then he said, your will be done to his father. At that point, he is arrested by people with swords and clubs, and he is humiliated on this Thursday. They whipped him. They degraded him. They put on fake robes and said, behold, the king of the Jews. They were mocking him. Really the awful day. It's also where he washed the disciples' feet and instituted the communion. Friday, April 3rd, after being betrayed by Judas, and people with swords and clubs came to arrest him. There was this trial that, if you listen to the Bible in Small Steps, it talked about it being a reverse trial. First they decide he's guilty, then they try to get people to say what he did, and then they bring him before Pontius Pilate and demanded he be pronounced guilty. My take on it is that Pontius Pilate didn't care. He, he wants to keep the peace. He wants to just keep things going, but Pontius Pilate let them do what they wished to do. He was also tried by Herod Antipas, which is Herod the Great's son, who wasn't so great himself. And at that point, he was tortured and beaten. He was put on the cross at 9 a.m. He died at 3 p.m. and was buried later that day. Skies went dark, there was an earthquake, and the temple curtain was torn in two. I was told that that curtain being torn in two means that there's no separation between God and man anymore. You don't have to have people go into the inner chamber and speak to God and pray for the people of God. You can now do it yourself. There is no more curtain. This fulfills the Passover, which is the lamb being sacrificed for the sins of the people. This is a flashback to Passover's first Passover in Egypt. We'll talk about that in another podcast. Everything that Jesus was trying to do and everyone was trying to talk him out of. Remember, the devil tried to get him to stop doing this. His apostles tried to get him to stop doing this. I'm sure the Jewish leadership just wanted him to go away. But if he went away and didn't do this thing, we're not saved. We have no atonement for our sins. And this is also called Good Friday. Then that Saturday, is Saturday, April 4th. Again, these are in Jewish calendar times, and the Jewish calendar is interesting. It's very regular, but it also means that our Easter time is irregular because we're on different schedules. But this would be Saturday, April 4th, the Jewish Sabbath. So that's going to be, you can't do any work, you can't do anything. And if they didn't hurry up on Friday before sunset and get Jesus buried, he would have had to stay out there the entire time. Joseph of Arimathea used his family plot to put Jesus into the tomb that had a gigantic stone rolled in front of the door as part of the tradition. But breaking Sabbath, the Jewish leadership went to Pontius Pilate and asked for permission to have guards to secure the tomb because they said that if someone steals his body, this next lie will be worse than the first, the first being his mission on earth, him healing people. He was doing all that part of the devil. But if his people steal the body, suddenly he's going to become a superstar and we can't let that happen. So they end up going and asking Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate agrees to it, gives them what they're looking for. And so 
that's what they get. Our apostles, they went into hiding. They spread like animals, hearing a loud noise, or what Jesus says, the sheep scatter when the shepherd is taken. I also called this on my podcast last year, Wigged Out Saturday, because everybody thought Jesus was going to be the Messiah, thought he was going to bring back the church. They all probably had images of what that looked like. Some of them thought it meant liberation from the Romans. Some of it thought saving for us from our sins. All the things that they thought was going to happen, suddenly Jesus is dead. Again, the apostles scattered, the women stayed by and prepared the body. And I can't imagine what people must have felt about this. They are, were crushed. Instead of wigged out Saturday, sometimes people call this Holy Saturday or Black Saturday. And then on our last week, we get to Sunday, April 5th, when the female disciples came to Jesus' tomb. Mary Magdalene approached it. The angel of the Lord, I asked my pastor, and he said that in the Old Testament, when it says the mess, the angel of the Lord, that is Jesus, and that it's Jesus before he entered his body on earth. When it's in the New Testament, it's harder to tell. We think so. My pastor thinks so, but we're just not certain. I really think so. But the angel of the Lord, he was sitting on the stone. I mean, the stone was huge, so he was way up there and opened the tomb up. Not so Jesus could get let out, because obviously he can walk through anything, but to let the people in so they can find it without a body, so they can see that there is no Jesus there. Of course, this is Easter Sunday. The angel told them he has risen. The, he was resurrected. So many people felt that Jesus was not really on the cross. It was somebody else. It was mistaken identity, or he didn't really die. He just looked like he was dying. But now, the angel of the Lord, which is Jesus, tells him he was resurrected, but he has risen. And this is the first of the resurrection into the holy body. And the official victory over sin, the defeat of death, and the basis of everything Christians believe. And Paul said it, that if this did not happen, our faith is in vain. This is the whole point of the Christian faith right here on Easter Sunday. So that's just a short list of the last week of Christ. Um, it's not really part of the book, but the question is, is why did everything mean what it meant? According to this book, the people laying down the palms, worshiping Jesus, him coming in lowly, was him as not being part of this Roman temple conglomeration. They would have come in the big fancy door on horses the Romans would have looked majestic, but this is our humble Lord coming in, in the peasant's gate on a donkey. And in the book, they call it a peasant procession as compared to the other one, which was an imperial procession. And while I think that is true, that it was primarily peasants, we know that Joseph of Arimathea was a worshiper and was a rich man. We know of other rich people, namely Martha and Mary and Lazarus, we're all so wealthy. Jesus is the savior of everybody. Leadership, the downtrodden, the poor, the hungry, the rich. Jesus came here to die for everybody, not just for the peasants. So I think it takes it a little bit more strongly than I would care to take it. But the point is that the people who follow Jesus into the city are probably mostly nobodies, and which is why the temple structure didn't take them seriously. The other interesting thing is this was a time of Passover. A lot of people would have been coming, maybe from 50 to 100,000 people would have been coming into the city to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem at the temple. I thought that they brought up an interesting point when it came to sacrifices and why sacrifice, and they go into a lot of details about the different types of sacrifices that are made. But I thought that the thing that intrigued me the most about it, because we can see that sacrifice was about giving up something meaningful to yourself. It was about requirements in the Old Testament, which we'll talk about in the Bible in small steps when we get to the Old Testament. But it also has to do with fellowship. At that point, they had table fellowship, which means sharing a meal with other people. And in a sense, when you are giving an animal sacrifice to God, you are sharing a meal with God. You are having that offering. Again, you've seen in the special weddings that Jesus 
talked about come to my wedding and in the parable of the man who was having his son be wedded, I killed the fatted calf. Come to this wedding. You know, it's a special thing you did for somebody. The prodigal son coming home. Go kill an animal so we can feast and share in this rejoicing. And in a sense, when we share this animal sacrifice in that time, it was about sharing a meal and a gift with God himself. I thought that was kind of interesting. I never heard that take on it. But the important part to remember they bring out is that sacrifice and worship and everything that you do has to be done with the right heart. In Amos 5, 21 through 24, it says, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melodies of your harps, but let justice roll down like water and righteousness flow like an ever-flowing stream. So while sacrifice was a big part of the Jewish faith, God wanted the heart. He wanted the worship, the righteousness to be in there too. This was not just about show. And I think at that temple, When people were trading back and forth, selling animals, they wanted to just appease God. It, like I said, reminds me of my friend who would go out and blow out every sin she possibly could on the weekends and then on Sunday go in and on Sunday church at night because we wanted to still have fun on Sunday and ask God for forgiveness. It was a cheap grace. And in this case, these were cheap, though expensive, sacrifices. He does not want us to come into this. The book also goes some other stories of Jesus talking about when he was asked if they should pay taxes. And it was a trap because, again, if he says yes, the people will hate him because they didn't want to pay taxes. Who does? And if he said no, then he's in trouble with the Romans because now he's saying, don't pay your taxes. But instead, he did a different type of response. He said, whose face is on this coin? And then, of course, it's going to be Tiberius Caesar. This is going to be Augustus Caesar's son, adopted son. And it says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. And render means to return. And this is what makes me believe they're wrong about this book because the the place of government and of taxes, that is Caesar's. While we here in the United States have votes about that, it is not the business of our church to talk about that. Instead, Render to God what is God's, and what is God's? God is the people. The people belong to God. Their faith, their minds, and their souls, that's what belongs to God, in my opinion. And so in me, that reinforces the whole idea that this is not about government. This is about people, their inner lives, their inner thoughts, how they treat God, and how they treat their neighbors. And then they mention he talks about Exodus because Exodus would have been something the Sadducees respected. They only believed in the Torah. So he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And said that God is not the God of the dead, but the living. They take it to mean that God is for the living people and not talking about what happens after death. He is not talking about what happens to people after they die. He is talking about right here, right now, in this kingdom. Well, I say it's an indication to me that if we go to heaven, we see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He mentions it to the tax collectors in Matthew that they're all going to hang out. He's saying they're alive and not that his kingdom is only about this world. Brings up that also in the Passion Week, that these stones are not going to have one standing on another. He sa- they give this example that Josephus reported that the stones measured 68 feet long, 9 feet high, 8 feet wide. These were big stones. I got to see some of the old Temple Mount in Jerusalem when I was there. I mean, it's huge. And one of the largest ones was 40 feet long, 10 feet high, and 14 feet wide. Estimated weight of 500 tons. And yet, not one stone is going to stand on the other. This is going to be a hard thing to bring down. But 
The Romans are very dedicated, and when they say they're going to tear something down, they tear it down, but good. This is going to happen in 70 AD, which is the point of the book that we are talking about this dominion of the Romans and the collaboration of the temple, and that is going to come all apart in 70 AD, and it does in a big way. He shows them in this week, too, what they, what this book calls a little apocalypse and the big apocalypse, that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, and this is the birth pang. But this is the big apocalypse, right? The end of the world. But we shouldn't be alarmed because these birth pangs must happen. But then he also talks what this book calls the little apocalypse, that these apostles are going to go and be handed over to consuls, beaten by synagogues, standing before governors and kings, and they will be put to death. But don't worry, the Holy Spirit's going to tell you what to say. You'll be hated by everyone, but in the end, you will be saved. So it's a grim conversation during this week to his apostles as well. And then this warning not to look for false messiahs. At the time when Jesus came, I was told there were over 80 people claiming to be the Messiah. And I asked someone there, a Jewish person there, well, why is it that people worship Jesus and not these 79 other people? And he said, well, because those 79 people died and ended up in the grave and that was the end of it. And that's why people worship Jesus and not the other 79. And then Jesus says that when we see him again, it's going to be like lightning in the sky, and then he will send his angels out. So the next time Jesus comes back in his glory, everybody in the planet's going to see it. That's the great apocalypse. And so the book talks about the fact that he warns them that there will be false messiahs, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes and famines, persecution, sacrilege, times of great suffering, more than that has ever existed, and cosmic disorder darkening of the sun, no light from the moon, and stars falling from the sky. And then we see the Son of Man coming. But he tells them to keep alert, keep awake, and make sure no one leads you astray. That was all on the Tuesday of the week. So these were big messages coming to them. So we're going to stop it here. We're going to pick up Wednesday and through the rest of the week in the next podcast. And then next week, we'll talk more about the rest of the week, that what happened and what was going on. So my challenge to you is think about, gosh, who would you be in this story? I think about that all the time. Would you be the person who scattered when Jesus went into Jerusalem and they said, oh, I'm not going to be anywhere a part of that. I'm kind of that person. When I see there's trouble, I head the other way. Would you be the person who puts down your cloak, puts down palm leaves in front of Jesus to worship him? Would you be the person who's listening to his messages about the end of the world and thinking about what happens next? Or would you be part of the structure that wants to keep order and wants everything to go well? Just give it a little bit of thought. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always go to smallstepswithgod.com. That is going to be the headquarters of my podcast about Christianity. I'm going to try to get more resources there but it is the place where you can go to find everything out about resources and tools that I use. Again, not there yet, but I'm hoping to work on that soon. The other thing that's starting that is unrelated to my Christian podcast is this week coming up, the Buzz Blossom and Squeak podcast is going to start. I am a big nature fan. I love going out and hiking and seeing different critters and auroras and stars. I'm even interested in rocks, and that's what this podcast is about. It's going to be about discovering nature right outside your front door. It's going to be a little tiny bit of science, but it's mostly going to be about how to better appreciate everything you see outside of the world around you. I called it at one time, discovering creation using small steps. Well, I decided not to put small steps in the title, which is probably a branding mistake, but I hope you listen to it. That should be starting out this next week. And remember, our walk into Jerusalem with our humble Lord starts with small steps. 